You're joined now by David Seymour, leader of the ACT Party, who yesterday launched their law and order policy. But is it simply uh, trying to restore some policies that have been kiboshed by this uh, government? David Seymour, first up, you're going to reinstate the three strikes law, which has now been struck out. Uh, why do you think that's so important? Well, it's very hard to victimise someone uh, when you're behind bars. The real point of three strikes is that the worst of the worst, uh, fool me once, you get a second chance, fool me twice, maybe another chance. Uh, if you do three serious violent or sexual offences, then you should get the maximum penalty so you're out of circulation for as long as possible. The fact Labor have chosen to get rid of that at this particular time, sending an early Christmas present to the worst offenders of a clean slate for Christmas has got to be one of the stupidest policy signals any government's ever sent. Uh, we're sending the opposite signal. Uh, if that's a part of the next government, we'll put it back. All right. You're going to put burglary in there too. Yeah, and it takes a, it's worth just explaining that it's a separate regime. So we're not going to make burglary uh, a strike offence under the existing three strikes regime. We're going to have a parallel regime where if you do three burglaries, you get a minimum of three years. And the reason for that is that we've always been clear, this is not like America where you steal a loaf of bread and you go to jail for 18 years. Um, three strikes in New Zealand is reserved for violent and sexual offences. But right. separately, yeah. uh, burglary is a crime that is done by a small group of largely professional criminals. And we want to make sure that if you do catch them, because they, they don't get caught very often for the amount of time they do it, that they go away for an absolute minimum of three years uh, if they get caught three times. And uh, that's, that's, so that's separate from, from the other three strikes regime, but it does reflect the fact that a small group of recidivist burglars are doing far too many burglaries. All right. You've also said you want to give retailers the power to decide what punishment young shoplifters receive. That seems a rather broad um, remit for shop owners. Are they going to be allowed to chop their hands off, uh, give them the death penalty? What parameters would you put around that? Uh, well, we're certainly not going to bring in punitive amputation. I think they do that in the Middle East, but it's not a policy that ACT is advocating here in New Zealand. Uh, what we would do is take the bureaucracy out of punishing kids right now. Uh, you know, a 10 to 14 year old who shoplifts gets no penalties under the law. A 14 to 17 year old can go to youth court. Uh, it takes six months. It takes up a huge amount of police time. And actually, if they do get punished, often the kid can't connect the punishment with the crime because all parents know if you want to discipline a kid, you've got to do it immediately so they make the connection. Uh, what we're proposing is an infringement notice regime where if somebody shoplifts, they can get an infringement notice and the police officer, in cooperation with the retailer, it's not just the retailer, but in cooperation with the retailer, can actually decide uh, what the punishment is. And it might be as simple as you got caught shoplifting, your punishment is you will apologise to the shoplifter, pay it back, and on the weekend, this Saturday morning, you're going to clean all the graffiti around that shop. Uh, so it's instant, it's practical, it releases the police officers uh, from the bureaucracy because what youth aid police officers tell me is that often, by the time they finish the paperwork, the kid's already committed another crime. Right. Uh, I also note here you want to review the use of electronic monitoring sentences for violent offenders. Would that also include... Uh, sexual offenders or only those who are violent? Uh, look, it, it's for violent and sexual offenders. Tony Severin is ex correction spokesperson and she's been doing some really good work mining the written parliamentary questions in Parliament. It's astonishing what she's found. 889 gangsters, that is people on the national gang list, have been put on um, non-custodial sentences, so they're basically being out on ankle bracelets, and of those, about 300 of those gangsters on ankle bracelets were there for violent offences, uh, and then 44 were for violent offences with weapons. On the other hand, uh, paedophiles, sexual offenders against children, 
Uh, there's also a significant number of those that are out on ankle bracelets, and within that, uh, you had a couple of dozen who actually tampered with the ankle bracelet, and they've been literally covering them, covering them with tin foil. We hear, um, in order to evade detection when they go AWOL. Now, the last thing anyone wants in their community is a paedophile on home detention. But they certainly don't want them if they've been fiddling with their ankle bracelets and getting off scot-free. All right, so that would likely increase the prison population, as would, one assumes, another policy you announced yesterday, abolishing the prison population reduction target. Where are we going to keep all these people who were previously uh, out with ankle bracelets? Um and how do you budget? How much are you prepared to spend on new prisons? Well, let's put it in context at the moment. Uh, we're spending a couple of billion on imprisoning people. Uh, if you reversed Labor's reduction in the prison population increased at 10%, <coughs> um, then that's a couple of hundred million. I think in the context of a government that's currently spending $127 billion, uh, we would be talking about... 0.1 to 0.2 percent of the government budget uh, to put some more people behind bars and if that means that people can actually walk around our cities that we don't have people like the person i met last night who told me she ubers from door to door in auckland because she's afraid to walk around or someone else i spoke to today visiting the city she refuses to have her company accommodate her on queen street because she finds it too scary to be down there uh, if we can restore safety to our cities then i think it's the best 0.1 to 0.2 percent of gdp this government's ever spent all right you would also uh implement a standard annual increase in the police staffing budget in line with population growth which would seem to me a fairly blunt way of of staffing or, or funding police staffing Surely you'd also want a police department that looked at doing um, more with fewer staff and look for efficiencies in the way it operated. Well, I agree with that, and, and actually our policy is designed to do exactly that. You see, over the last 10 years, we've had the endless he said, she said, how many police are there? We promised 1,400, we only delivered 1,200. You said there'd be more. The police association says there's less. People are absolutely sick of it. Actually, what we need to do is say our policy is that the police force will be uh, in tide in proportion to the population. So for every 500 citizens, there'll be a police officer. Once you've got that nauseating debate off the table, you can start asking more important questions like, what sort of skills and training and equipment do these police officers have? What sort of time use do they have? Are they spending all of their time on domestic violence call-outs and self-harm incidents, effectively being social workers, um, when actually they need to be out catching violent criminals? For example, because what I'm hearing from the police on the beat is that if they get a domestic violence or self-harm incident, that's a squad car and two officers out for the whole of the eight-hour shift. That's why there's a shortage of cops on the beat. So we want to take the emphasis away from this constant he said, she said on the number of cops, put the political emphasis back onto, well, what are they doing? Do they have the skills and equipment to do it? I think everyone would be happier if we could focus on those questions instead of arguing about whether there's the right amount that were promised at the last election. All right. Without doubt, in public perception right now and in media coverage, the two crimes or areas of crime which are getting the most coverage and I would say causing the most public concern are ram raids and gang shootings. In relation to those two types of offences, what is your policy, what new policies would you have to counter them? Well, starting with the second one first, our view is that uh, if you don't have good economic analysis, you'll never solve a policy problem. So our starting point for the uh, gangs and all of their activity is why do people join gangs? Because it's their most lucrative option. The gangs are not paying any tax. They get almost no none of their ill-gotten gains 
forfeited. Uh, so we would actually sick the IRD on them, make them explain where their wealth comes from, and if they can't explain it, they're in trouble. And then if we find someone who's on the national gang list committing a crime and using illegal firearms, it's open season on everything that they own. Uh, these are pretty harsh measures, but you know the fact is that so long as it's profitable to run a gang dealing drugs, people will keep joining them, people will keep doing it. So it's all about economics when it comes to dealing with the gangs. And people famously say that's how um, Al Capone was brought down too, so there's something to it. I just say also on the ram raids, first of all, I don't know a kid that didn't start, uh, first of all, being truant, second of all, shoplifting, and then ram raiding. So our policies around education, making sure kids go to school, paying kid, paying schools for the number of kids that show up, not the number they enrol once a year, uh, that is important. Uh, our instant <coughs> practical penalties for shoplifting are important. But ultimately, when it comes to the small number of kids that are ram raiding and they're out there doing it, as we saw just yesterday, with camera people attending to try and capture the crimes, uh, what we need to do with them uh, is actually have good places for them to go and that comes down to Oranga Tamariki who currently are just not providing anywhere for youth aid police officers to take the worst kids and um, what the cops tell me is look ultimately you've got to have places that they want to stay otherwise they just escape uh, and end up committing more crimes. All right so nothing specific on ram raiding except trying to build what a fence at the top of the cliff? Well, I think if you can stop them at the shoplifting and truancy point, then that's a much more efficient way than going after them later. But if you want to get them deal dealt with after they're ram raiding, that's the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff, uh, then it does come down to being able to actually put them somewhere where they're going to be rehabilitated because otherwise, uh, the, as the cops say, we take them home to their parents. If their parents are any good, they wouldn't have been ram raiding in the first place. Um, by the time the night's over, they've got out and done another one. Mm. Look, finally, David, on an unrelated issue, bullying. Bullying seems to be the catch cry around Parliament at the moment. Labor's got the Sharma drama. And, of course, uh, Ben Uffendall has, has come a, a cropper. Are you confident that all members of the ACT caucus have had tidy flats when they were students and weren't schoolyard bullies or bullies of any other type? Well, I've said to my caucus, if there's anything you're worried about, come and tell me now, because until you tell me everything, I can't help you. So, yes, I am confident on the basis they haven't told me anything. If they haven't, then I can't help them. But what I'd also say is uh, the question is not what happens. Bad things happen throughout life. It's how you deal with it. Um, and I'm also uh, very focused on making sure ACT has the right culture so that we deal with it well. I think people will make their own conclusions about how other parties have dealt with the challenges that they've faced over the last sort of eight to ten days. Yes, indeed they will, won't they, uh, uh, David Seymour? Sam Uffendall, of course, not Ben Uffendall. That is a Freudian slip I've made a few times.